before my interview with Jake Diffenbach from Rivers of Nile comes in, Sam, let us talk about the new Rivers of Nile album. It is called The Work. It is out on September 24th via Metal Blade Records. It is the band's fourth record and the follow-up to 2018's Where Elves Know My Name. I feel that Rivers of Nile are one of, if not the best, progressive death metal band that we've got right now. Where Elves Know My Name was this beautifully written record that intertwined elements of jazz with death metal in a, in a really seamless, kind of mind-blowing way. Rivers of Nile aren't the first band to do that. I Harson have used like kind of jazz elements in their music as well before, but Rivers of Nile were the first band to do that, and I felt it with such effect. I remember sending you. Where else now my name? I was like, dude, you've got to hear this. This is ridiculous. Some of the stuff they pull off here. I don't remember us ever really talking about the album before, but I remember the kind of sparks and bits that you heard. You all, you seem to be quite captured by and, and really kind of moved by the impressive songwriting nature that Rivers of Nile would just boast <laughs> and just boast like whenever they felt like it. So when it comes to the work, and we'll look, you know, it's going to follow up this album, Where Else Now My Name, that was really kind of grasped and held on to by the death metal community. I went and saw Rivers of Nile. I've seen them a couple of times, actually, on, on both occasions. People are walking around with, like, inflatable saxophones and swinging them around while they play. When I saw them headline their Birmingham show, they actually brought a saxophonist out with them. It might have actually been the saxophonist that plays on that played on the record. I can't remember off the top of my head. Regardless, they're looking out into the crowd and they're seeing you know, everyone holding, throwing inflatable saxophones and everyone's really bought into this concept. And I can't imagine how difficult it must have been to watch all that happen and then have the inner steel to say, yeah, uh, this is great and everyone's caught on. We're not going to do this in the next record, though. They'll, we'll do a bit of it, but we're going to do something else in the next record. And one of the things that I want to kind of nail down in this review is that the, these Rivers of Nile albums have kind of followed this apocalyptic concept of uh, the, you know, one record was about the world ending the uh, where else now my name followed up with this one final sentient being that is the last uh, person left on earth and i am take you know they haven't explicitly said what the work is about but i've taken the work as this kind of rebuilding of humanity so from that alone rivers of nile are this incredibly bold brave band that are doing these apocalyptic concept records and to have the guts to see the reaction to where else now my name and then specifically choose to not then follow that structure on the follow-up album when there's more momentum behind the band than there has ever been before takes real inner steel i feel and i believe sam that that decision has paid them back a dividends because i think that there that there are parts of the work that for me uh, act like borderline genius i, I think that this album is reaches intelligent levels of songwriting that j is difficult for me to really talk about. We spoke about Colors 2 by Between the Buried and Me, and I think that's probably going to be the most musically impressive album we'll hear this year. But in terms yeah. of delivery, in terms of delivering what I like to hear, as well as making it this really intelligent, hard to pick apart record, I think this is one of the great 50 minutes of that that I've heard since getting into extreme metal I, I think this is really 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 brilliant i'm i've been fully in on rivers of nile for a long time so i suppose really in terms of gauging where we are let's start with you who has been on the bandwagon for a lot less time or has maybe never even been on the bandwagon Mate, the work by rivers of nile what are we feeling it's good with some great moments but it is not in my opinion as altering as you feel that it is talk to me uh, okay um i think this is an impressive album but it's a bit of a bamboozling one where um for me for me it's impressive musically but actually i'm not as i'm not as in on the songwriting styles and structures as yourself um i like it i think it's i think i think it's clever i think some of these songs are really well written there's some massive songs on here i think Having Tower with the piano beginning, the with the, with the explosive um, introduction, like it's a nice foreshadowing of what's going to happen on the album later. 
Um, but I'll I'll be honest, I didn't enjoy the following two songs. I didn't think Dreaming Black Clockwork was uh, or or White did did enough for me personally. I felt that at times the songwriting can be a bit fractured um and sort of randomly assembled. Um but by the time I got to the midpoint of the album, to the later section, uh, I thought it got a lot, lot better. I thought Focus was was terrific. I thought Clean um, was really, really good. It was a beautiful solo in Clean. Uh, really nice transitional build-up. And I thought that was the first truly impressive song where I could see where you were coming from. Um, I think Void, from which now sound escapes, is the best song on the album. Um, great Clean. Uh, song overall uh, lovely juxtapositions from heavy to cleans there's massive chords that section around the three and a half minute even before the sax solo comes in because it, like you say it does become a gimmick after a while and you don't want to write songs that kind of make people feel like wrestler intros where they just like have to react in this jokey kind of way you're going to be taken seriously so I, i'm aware of that um but the, it's the central figure to those huge chords that get returned back to at the end um i love the chaos and the rage at the end of that song i, I really think that's that that void which now sound escapes is really really terrific um and tower two is a wonderful solo at the end of that a more question mark with the the, the tempo changes and and the anger i think i think it's really really good really really good episode that conclusion at the end the way that it builds up to that that transcendent conclusion is is, is really really fantastic especially the way that song was uh, that solo has been constructed in like a very melodic pink floyd dark side of the moon sort of feel to it and i love the melodic section of maybe one day and the the ambition of terra stera four um, with some terrific moments and tempo changes and the concluding guitar melody is is really 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 good um but overall for me at times it does feel like some disparate ideas that are loosely connected together by a band that are trying to show off their ambition more than a, a singularly connected idea all too often and that for me created a level of distance and as impressed as i was by some of the musicalities i often am with bands of this nature i i'm going to upset you but this isn't this is like 70 percent as good as oceans of slumber for me in that kind of proggy death metal kind of world um just it's just horses for courses i still think this is really good and like i said there are three utterly terrific songs um in the void in which no song sound makes um and focus and episode are terrific terrific um progressive death metal songs i don't think the rest of it as an as an actual cohesive unit is like an album of the year contender for me so your oceans of slumber call has upset me much less than you would have imagined to do so because dude this is the exact reason why we do this podcast man and uh, it's kind of better sometimes when we disagree because I, I find it actually astonishing that you don't like white because I think that white is, I think that white is one of the moments where the album's real genius is held for me because I think the melody to the track is really nothing short of stunning and Remember what we're talking about here. We're talking about a progressive death metal band, and I, I've just said the melody to this track is nothing short of stunning. That that sent that sentence should be something of an oxymoron, or at least a juxtaposition. Yeah, that, so that, it, it, I, that shouldn't be something that I can say. But I, I feel like Rivers of Nile on this record. They don't just make that concept work on white. They do it. They do it more times than I'm able to count. You mentioned maybe one day, dude. Maybe One Day is an acoustic guitar song. That song could have been sung by Charlie Simpson on one of his solo albums. For for 90% of it, that song could have been sung by Charlie Simpson on one of his solo albums. It's an acoustic song. They're a progressive death metal band, but it's amazing. And the back, oh, the backing vocals on Maybe One Day, I, I just sat and listened. It was like, this is like stunning. It's so, so brilliant. The drums as well. I mean, Rivers of Nile have gone th gone through a few drummers for uh, for whatever reason, but I, I think that that uh, there's moments like where Jared Klein he is, he's ridiculous on this album. You mentioned that the void from which now a sound escapes is your favourite song. I would agree. That kind of piano soft opening. How many death metal bands can make that work? I mean, please. It, it breaks into this kind of techno space sound again how many death metal bands can make that work the background clean vocals are a fitting backdrop uh jake who who i interview and the interviews come up at the end of this episode 
his range I've never heard as good as this. I feel like this is probably his best moment. This record is his best moment. And from the void from which Noah Sound escapes is his best moment on this record. You, I thought that maybe you wouldn't be as in on this record as me, but I thought that the moment that would surely grab you is Terraria 4. You did mention that you liked that song, didn't you? I did. I did. Um, I thought it was, it was incredibly well constructed and who doesn't love an 11 minute death metal song? Yeah. But I want to, I want to come back to you because I think the more interesting narrative is how much you enjoy this. I was, I, I was surprised listening to this album, how much you love this. This is so passive for someone of your taste. <laughs> like as an album, like I, I don't mean it as a criticism. It is not, I mean, it's heavy in moments, but Chris, there's so much of this where you are waiting for the, for the, for the, for the crescendo and stuff. And that is usually something that's been such an issue for you before where you're like, when is this taking place? Why am I here for yeah. four and a half minutes? And, and there's, oh, there's a lot of this. I'll say about 40% of this is clean guitar, isn't it? Where there with slow vocals in the midst of like this chaos and stuff, which usually I'm telling you is the better. The, how, yeah. how, how has this happened? Because I listened to this twice the, or or. or all the way through in the last two days and I came away and I love this type of stuff. Usually I came away thinking at times for me, it's a bit meandering. What about this, especially in comparison to other progressive death metal, where you're saying a lot of things like no other death metal band have done this, but if other metal death metal bands have done this, you might have not have enjoyed it. What about this has won you over? What is so special about this band doing this style that you've been so previously critical of? Because I think Brody Utley, the lead guitarist is the best like I think the payoffs are the best payoffs they might you, do you know what I mean like if we just specifically pick wait a song that I was talking about and kind of lathering over and you were like yeah, it's all right in it but like in, in <laughs> way on wait there's a real like I, I, I've literally written the words gorgeous beautiful and stunning so many times in my notes here it's literally just like just re repeat after repair after repeat but the, the melody is is really really like ethereal beautiful and then eventually when it all builds the tonality into the that it takes in the final two minutes there's this awesome solo that turns into like this epic kind of rock track with skyscraper vocals and a, the payoff if you don't if you're not into the melodic side of rivers of nile just wait just just no, no pun intended but just wait on that song because the the final moments make it all so worth it you were talking about uh, focus and clean and for me again that the same thing can be said there specifically on focus one of the things that's brilliant about this album one of the things that i love in, in amongst the million of things that i love about this album is that only on track four is it that the first time you get a feel that this could have maybe fit on Where Else Know My Name in, t in terms of style, tempo and punch? And considering that record was such a big deal for Rivers of Nile, their ability to take this kind of diversion that they have on the first three tracks that precede this song, I think is, is really bold and commendable. And that's not the only reason why it's good. It's great because I think it's great. And what the undeniably focus is a really really heavy brooding brilliant track but the melody of the chorus that comes back and forth is so capturing there's just something about the way rivers of Nile perform this and they structure these songs that just gets me from the void from which sound, now sound escapes it goes there's a literally a really heavy transition directly into more i think more is probably the heavy song on the record it's straight up death metal zero messing around it's a healthy three and a half minutes that doesn't try to be overly intelligent goes for the throat that's one of the few moments on this record where you where you can just listen to that song and it and you haven't really got to think much about it. The rest of this album kind of really forces you to really think about what's going on. And on episode, there's a start to that song, which I just don't think many other bands can do or they can attempt, but it wouldn't work. The really stripped back ethereal style, it kind of strikes as like a foreboding, like equally foreboding and intelligent in equal measures. And it lifts into this like aggro aggressive beat. And for you, that hasn't worked, but well, at least as well as what I'm making it as. But for me, the climax is always worth waiting around for, even if the melody doesn't grab you. But in my case, the melody 
is some of the genius, genius moments on this album. I think that any people will listen to maybe one day and it's going to be, it's an acoustic song pretty much by a death, by a progressive death metal band. But it, I think it's brilliant. It's like genius. It's amazing. How, how could they possibly have made an acoustic song work for themselves? How, how is that possible? I'm sorry, dude, but we were talking, we were reviewing Carcass two weeks ago. Carcass couldn't do an acoustic song. No, no, they couldn't. They, they would, and they, nor do Carcass want to or try to. I'm just making the, I'm trying to, like, I'm like bordering my claim of how many bands could even try this. And I think that on Terraria 4, the long instrumental that keeps you waiting and waiting and waiting, and then it immediately just drops into the hardest death metal sound you could possibly ask for. The, the, the scream of our work is never ending. It's this chugging groove lead rhythm riff. It's so cool. There are more sound transitions and tempo changes in that 11 minutes than should be possible. But it's so brilliantly written that you mentioned passive. Maybe in moments this record is passive, but if it captures you, it doesn't feel passive because the moments of melody, I'm stargazing. And then the moments where they're doing their death metal thing, I'm banging my head and trying not to flip my desk over. I think I think the record's so brilliant. I, I love it so much. I, am I surprised that you're not in love? Um, I don't know. Partly yes, because because in terms of song length and in terms of like idea and ambition. You I don't care thought... what it is, just make it long, shouts Sam. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of Song of Ambition, I thought that this would be right down your wheelhouse, but it's worth mentioning that I was already completely hooked on Rivers because I think Where Else Now My Name is brilliant, and I'm not sure what level of exposure you had to the album, apart from me chucking you the odd song. So I was already so in, and I was already so like buying into the idea of what they could do next with that sound. And I'm going to be honest with you, dude, if they did Where Else Now My Name 2.0, I'd still be sitting there saying, how great is this? But they really haven't, and they've progressed into this kind of space sound that is that has just captured me more than any prog album I've heard in our time doing this podcast. I think Rivers are a ridiculous band, and I think this is a ridiculous, ridiculous album. I've been in love with it so much. So you tweeted two weeks ago that this was your album. Obviously, this was the album you were referring to. That yeah, yeah. Talking about it's the album of the year. You didn't say that, but two and two. Yeah. Is that still the case? Well, yeah, like two, a few weeks ago, we received the album really, really early because of the interview that I was doing with Jake that comes at the end of this episode. And I put out a tweet like, I think I've heard the album of the year. Um, it's September and September's got this insane, crazy schedule. So you, it's anyone's guess who I'm talking about. I could be talking about Mastiff or Thrice or Rivers of Nile or Spirit Box or Employed to Surf or Sleep Tokens. Crazy. So far, dude, Hey, dude, every time I die, I've got an album coming out. Um, I haven't heard the Spirit Box album yet. There's still some big hitters to come. For me, this is my... This album moves me unlike anything else I've heard this year. Okay. When, it, when it comes to the time where we're really putting our list together, I will do my album of the year list based off the album that I enjoy listening to the most and not the one that's the most technically impressive. Because if we do album of the year based off what's most technically impressive... Let's just give it to Colours too now, because there's, yeah. there's there's no way we're going. There's no way an album's going to come out that's more technically impressive than Colours too. So if, if we're yeah. based on that, let's just give it to Colours too now. I'm going to base mine off the album that I enjoy listening to the most. This is the album that's that's moved me more than anything else I've heard this year in terms of me sitting there quietly thinking I'm so in love with this and I'm so into what this album tries to do. So as we speak, I probably would go for album for this being my favorite album of the year, but. And here's a, what an amazing thing this is to say, Sam. Got a long way to go yet and a lot of, a lot more records to come. And also, dude, I'm going to go back through the list, aren't I? I'm going to sift back through the list and there's going to be moments where I'm like, oh, I forgot about that. Oh, that album was amazing. Oh, this song's amazing. So I'm not going to say, oh, it's the album of the year, let's call it now. It's the definitely the album that's moved me the most. The work, Rivers of Nile. Brilliant. Fair enough. That is where we're going to leave off the episode. 
Uh, my God, Sam, that was a mammoth task, wasn't it? Four records to review. Um, I'd like to say, Sam, that that's where the the, the, uh, the podcast is going to let up from here, but I can't make such a promise because we've still got quite a stacked release schedule of which Dying Wish is included in that, and we are going to be reviewing the new Dying Wish album on the next episode. For now, my interview with Jake from Rivers of Nile comes up right now. Thank you so much for sticking around and listening. Uh, please follow us, like, or subscribe, depending on the service you are using. Me and Sam are going to be back in two weeks' time. Follow us on Twitter at Noise Podcast. For now, here is my interview with Jake Diffenbach from Rivers of Nile. Thank you so much for listening. We love you. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye.